All right, we're live. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming to Adobe Creative Camp today. Uh, we've had several sessions this whole weekend, and uh, there'll be still more to come. Um, it's, a, uh, it's been really great to see the turnout and the response uh, so far. Um, so uh, we are live streaming right now. We are live on twitch.tv slash adobe. Um, and there will also be these on-demand sessions available afterwards. So Paul's and Sonia's after this, uh, you'll be able to see them on Twitch archived uh, later as well. Um, the hashtag we're using today is hashtag Adobe South by Southwest. So um, feel free to use that as you're tweeting and Instagramming and whatnot on the interwebs uh, to, to let everyone know what you're doing. Um, here is the schedule for today. Sean did a great talk this morning. We've got Paul coming up now. Uh, Sonia will be uh, coming up next about branding. There's a really handsome looking guy from 2 to 3 p.m. today talking about video. I don't know who that guy is, but. Uh, and then Libby uh, rounded it out at the end of today. So we'd love to see you for all those sessions if you can make them. And uh, so today, we're very lucky to have Paul here. Um, our next presenter is a 20-year design veteran and senior worldwide evangelist for Adobe. Um, he uh, has traveled all over the world, and he says he's been to more countries uh, than years he's been alive. And Paul is no spring chicken, so I admit he's, uh, he must have been to quite a few countries. Uh, so he's a great designer and trainer on all things Adobe and a good friend. Please welcome Paul Tranny, everybody. Thanks, Dave. All right, cool. And I only know one language, and that one I don't even know very well, which is English. So anyways, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, this is the six things every designer should do right now or needs to know right now, essentially. This is, uh, you know, when I think of about this, the six things you need to know, just so you know, just to prepare yourself. It's not going to be like, uh, work smarter, not harder, right? So I'm like, what can I do with that? It's going to be a hands-on sort of session. I want to give you something you can take with you sort of right now, right away. So that's the whole goal, hands-on session. I'm sure we have sort of a, a, a plethora of designers in the room. I assume that we kind of cover the gamut from graphic designer on one end, clear down to UX, branding, motion, art direction, photography. Because designer is kind of a broad term. I'm assuming since we're at South by Southwest, we have a lot of graphic slash web design, getting into UI design. Just by a show of hands, is that you kind of fitting the top three is most of the people. OK, fantastic. And the big PS there, who has that open on a regular basis? You don't have to raise your other hand like I did. All right, cool. So that's perfect. Thank you, guys. I'm going to cover other tools, but these are, again, the things that you guys need to know. And I want to just, again, make this really practical. We know at the end of the day we need to do creative work. I want to do creative work. I want to do stuff faster so I can spend more time typically doing more work, uh, but sometimes getting outside on occasion or uh, getting more than six hours sleep. So that's why I like the 11 a.m. session. <laughs> All right, so let's dive right into it. So again, just, uh, just the level set, I want to make sure I'm paying attention to design trends. And I'm constantly doing this. And this is the only one that's like, well, I'm not going to go through the popular design trends. I've done that. I just want to be aware of them. That's just a fun picture. I just came from Miami. And I'm just addicted to like Miami style. It's awesome. And I'm waiting for the 80s style to come back, guys, quite frankly. But again, it's currently not a trend. What is hot right now? And we can track this. We know what's popular on you know, Adobe Stock, for instance. And Shutterstock does their own tracking as well. They know the number of sort of downloads to the term double exposure. So we know that's really popular right now. We know this hipster term is really popular, whether that's a filter or a way of shooting a photo, right? Uh, low poly as well, that sort of triangulation look, that's another term that probably gets lumped into low poly. All right, long shadow, zentangle, there's all the, they're all there, guys. Um, here's just a couple of, again, of them again, and you can find these online. These are just from my site. And again, most of these, again, just done in Photoshop. So I can show you how to do this. Obviously, double exposure has to do a lot with masking, sort of putting one photo inside of another, right? So overall, that's already out there. And you can learn how to do the hottest, the hottest trend. And what also starts to happen, and I'll kind of go over these stats as well, the most appreciated projects I don't have exact stats on this, guys. So 456 doesn't mean anything. I just wanted a bar graph to show that we have a lot. Is that wrong? So can we all admit hand lettering is like really popular right now? Murals, of course. 
uh, ink as well, sort of ink drawing. So it's this callback to actually this, the new creatives as we call them are doing more things sort of, you know, sort of pen on paper or pencil on paper. You know, and I think that's really cool to see in this age of technology, people are actually going back to their roots. And we recognize that, honestly, at Adobe, which is, again, why we make tools like Capture, for instance. So this is Adobe Capture. Just quick, you know, some hand lettering I did. Just go ahead and jump in there. And I, I want it vector, because I want to really kind of get some mileage out of it. And that's essentially what it's doing. Looks horrible right now, right? It's looking better. I'm not, I'm not crazy about the green. I don't know what I'm going to do about that. Maybe I'll fix that later. Okay, there we go. There's black. So essentially, that's the vectorized version. Becky Murphy talked yesterday, and she uses it a lot. So I can imagine a lot of those illustrations in the back are done that way. So they just, it just makes you look good, but let me leverage sort of the pen and paper or marker or whatever and use that. You know, again, sync it to my Creative Cloud library you know, with those other assets, and then it's going to be on my desktop as you can see here. Brush available as well. I love Brush, and I'm surprised we, I would love to see more with it. Eric Notsky is kind of one of the innovators behind that, and he spoke yesterday. His talk is actually available on Twitch as well, uh, on demand. But there's amazing things that you could do with it, just to create a new look just from an illustration, and again, bring that, let's bring that right into Photoshop, whether it's the type, as you can see, and just scrubbing through. You know, it started just as an illustration of whatever, and then I can manipulate it as I want in Photoshop, just messing with the color dynamics is all that's happening there. Right, because I want to create a new look that maybe I haven't seen before, or something that's maybe typically pretty difficult and uh, make it easy for me. So in the general, that's what we do is we see design trends. We, you know, we're not going to hop on the current trend, but we're going to leverage art, artists' capabilities and allow you to leverage your work through Creative Cloud libraries, through Adobe Capture, which is awesome. So let's move on from that. All right, so paying attention to design trends, we could access, use Capture. Again, it's free. Speed up your workflow. Yeah, sure. I, I would love to do that. How do we do that? <laughs> right now, everything we do is just like merely just like a habit. Like we could do it in our sleep, right? Wake up, me up in the middle of the night and I'll tell you what certain key commands can do because we do those things. Our workflows are literally sort of a force of habit. And that's cool, which means they're kind of hard to change. But I think everybody in this room is here because you guys are like, yeah, I could be better at what I do. I'd love to be better at what I do. And you guys have realized there might be a better way if I'm doing something that takes four steps. We recognize that at Adobe and we say, hey, we can try to get that down to say one if possible. So that's our goal and that's why we do plenty of studies in that area. So we ask that question. But again, in general, guys, it's hard to change because what do you do? I'm going to tell you this. Oh, you should do this. And you're like, and then and you'll be working next week. You're like, oh, Paul said to do something there. And you're like, think about it. And then you're like, go through your notes. And then just say, forget it because you're already wasted too much time on trying to find your resource. So I'm trying to make this as simple as possible. But it, be it becomes really important. And basically, I'm talking about shortcuts here. All right? So when it comes to your workflow, shortcuts. If I say, if I save two seconds, Every minute, that's a good thing. But what if, I, what if I can salvage two seconds out of every minute? Over the course of a typical workday, that starts to add up 480 minutes. Uh, you know, over the course of a year, 240 workdays equals to about 64 wasted hours. And I actually tweeted this out this morning. I'm sorry, I don't have the, um, the reference down at the bottom. Uh, but nonetheless, that kind of comes down to, if I could just save two seconds a minute when I work, that's like eight days, that's more than a vacation week that I could save. So I'm like a firm believer in shortcuts, at least the ones that I can remember and I can implement on a regular basis. So it's like huge to do this, which is why I'm going to do Command H right now, right? So this is hands-on, guys. I'm just going to jump into Photoshop and I'll probably make some mistakes, but we'll, uh, we'll have a good time and guaranteed you're either going to learn, affirm stuff that you know or learn some things as well. Starting out with even any dialogue, by the way. If I want to change this, of course, we know we could do this. But typically, if I want to change the opacity, I can always click on that, uh, that, that name, right? So that's how I can adjust that opacity. And that's, you probably stumbled upon that. And you can go beyond that, and I can say, OK, I want it to be 50%. I'm just going to hit 5. And it's going to start to be automatic to you. 5, you know, 75, 6, 6 
or 666 will reformat your hard drive. It won't do that. That's not. But nonetheless, that's what I can go back to zero. That's 100%. Work. I'm constantly using blend modes as a designer, right? That's what I'd want in this case. So again, this real estate of going from here. Oh, let's go over here. Oh, a couple seconds. Oh, la -di -da. Let's see down here. What was that one that I liked? Soft light, maybe? But that's what you difference? I've never used difference. <laughs> I feel like giving out a free prize if you ever show me a design you did it with difference, I'd be like, well, you used it for something, that's amazing. All right. But what I could just as easily do, guys, as I dive in here is just hold down the shift key and then plus and minus. So crucial when you're designing, because now I could just focus on my design rather than some random menu. So again, if this saves you two seconds, it kind of saved you eight days potentially in the long run, right? Go, going beyond that, shift option, right? I could hit O. I love overlay. I'll use overlay. I'll use multiply. Again, shift option. Actually, let me turn this on real fast, guys, so you guys can see. Shift option, M for multiply, uh, S for screen, right? So that looks good, and I can start to learn my top you know, three favorites, which those are them. <laughs> so in general, I'd say that, that looks pretty good. What, is, what if I wanted to duplicate this layer? What would, I hit, what would a shortcut key be for that? Command J. Command J. Who said that over here? Because you said it the loudest. And I'm going to try to not hit you. Oh, there we are. That was good. All right, so Command J will duplicate that. I could duplicate that as many times as I want. I can delete it. I can jump in. I can, I can just hit the trash can if I want to delete it. That's all pretty straightforward. Let me show you my favorite key pretty much for anything. Anytime I want the alternate for something or the option for it, I just think it's the, the, almost like the override key a lot of times is the option key right here. So if I just, because what would happen if I delete, the, hit the trash can? Ah, of course, I'm not an idiot. Yes, just freaking delete it. I hit the trash can, right? And I know you can say never show again. How many hit that before even reading it? <laughs> like whatever, yeah, I'm, just, I'm smart enough. I'm smarter than you, computer. So nonetheless, I could just hold down the Alt key and it's your override. So it's like just get rid of it, right? Let's go beyond that though. Check this out. Say, um, for this image, I want to, you know, Command M will bring up curves. And I'll, you'll do this, you'll be in a dialogue and be like, okay, I'm gonna kinda play with this. And I kinda, you know, I don't know if this was some radiation accident, this would work out great. <laughs> so you're like, that sucks, and you'll hit cancel, right? And then you'll go back into it. And you're like, okay, maybe I'll do this. You don't need to do that, because whether you screw it up or not, you hold down the option key, look what happens to the reset button right over here. You guys seeing that? Cancel just changes to reset in any of these dialog boxes. So I don't have to freaking try to just move these around again or cancel out of it and go back. Just reset it, thank you very much. And now I can jump in. In talking about these dialogs as well, it's always so cool. This little guy right down here, we could see him, kind of small, but he essentially lets us work directly on the image. So you'll see that in various dialogues. Rather than working in these, di these uh, you know, this histogram, let me make this midtone lighter. And I'm working right on that. It's adjusting the curve. Let's make this darker because I want it just to have more contrast. I'm working directly on the image because that histogram almost means nothing to me to a certain degree, right? So again, so look out for that. You know, click OK, click Cancel, whatever. We can sort of move on from there, right? But these are just practical things that you should just be keeping in mind and working on. Brushes really fast. You know, if I wanted to sharpen this. Again, we always sneak in little things. Because guess what, guys? I select the Sharpen tool. You guys are like, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> you're not supposed to use that tool. You're supposed to do Unsharp Mask and do a bunch of layer, mo whatever. Doesn't matter. Because you automatic, if you've been in the business for a while, you discount some tools because you tried it out once about five years ago and decided it didn't work. And this is what I mean about sharpen. Check this out. Like, let me just sharpen this drastically, and it's like it just creates this gray blob, and that's not what I want because it doesn't protect the details. So what do we do? We'll say, hey, you know what? Let's go ahead and add this in here, which basically minimizes the pixelation while protecting those details. 
And, uh, oops, sorry, let me get out of the key. And now, see, as I press down, again, just to show you that it's not burning that image, okay? So there's little keys like that will actually just make your old tools better or the tools that have been around a while better is all I'm saying, right? Well, I could show you a number of those examples, right? Anytime you see use legacy, have you guys seen that? Well, we've updated it, but we also don't want to tick off the old users, so we have to add in use legacy, and that's one of those items. Okay, so let's move on. I'm using the brush. You guys know the bracket keys can decrease and increase the size, right, rather than going up here, right, rather than going to this menu. That's great. I hold on a shift key and watch it'll get harder and softer. The hardness changes, but I really can't tell if it's the shift key, you know, it changes that. This is what I do. This is my shortcut that I use. Turn this on. Control and option. So now if I click, I can decide whether I want it to larger or smaller. This is a visual representation of it. So I'm like, okay, well, I want it a little, let's get it about normal size. And then I want lots of feathering. So I don't want much hardness. I'm dragging up. But I can actually physically, physically, visually see uh, what it looks like there. And then I can start to w work on this detail in this image. All right. So just some quick ones. Bracket keys are huge when you're you know, working with brushes. Control option will uh, give you that visual representation. You know, going on from there, if I dive into, you know, again, you guys know you, you, guys, know you guys can do this. You can add as many keyboard shortcuts you could do this all day long. I think it's really cool that you can jump in and uh, let's go into tools. Does anybody know that there's, there's all these tools and you'll hit, you know, say V for your selection tool or, you know, B for brush to switch to those tools that you know and love? And then there's also two keys on your keyboard that are available as well. Does anybody know those? That's a tough question. There's two keys. If I hit them on my keyboard, nothing happens. So they're available. And one of them is, I'll use it for foreground color picker, N and then background color picker for K. And those are the two keys that are actually available. All these keyboard shortcuts travel with your workspace. And I can have different ones for each workspace, just as an FYI. OK, so you're going to do that, and you're going to forget about it, right? You're like, ah, I did it once. Well, you can summarize right here. This will actually give me a printout, put it on my desktop, and I can print it out and just like highlight the ones I. You literally have to do that for like a day, and then you're good to go. There's others I have set up here. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to go into, I'm going to go into this now. Let's just click OK. Uh, it's kind of hard to see for you guys. But uh, your tools panel over here, right? Well, we can also customize that. And we just added this recently, the ability to edit the toolbar, right? So selecting that, like, I never use the hand tool because that's the space bar or the rotate tool is R. I just move, zoom tool, you guys know this. So the tools that you might know, you could just move over. That's going to free up a real estate over here on the side. Eraser tool, whether I want it there or not, it's totally up to you. But you can see how you can sort of disable and it will actually appear in the flat menu. And look how it's changing already. So it makes it much more simple. And if you really wanted to mess with somebody, you could put like the move tool like over here if they don't know. And then you can like turn off that actual button and be like, did you, did you pay your membership? Did you pay? Because I think they start eliminating tools. <laughs> no, we don't, we don't do that. And don't do that. That's cruel. But you could. I'm just saying. I'll separate these out and make sure the, uh, yeah, I think that's actually pretty good overall. Click done. And that's set up the way I like it. And typically, I'd remove the history brush. And I, I don't use the eraser that much, things like that but it just helps my whole real estate there. All right, so those are just like some mad shortcuts thrown at you guys. This is going to be, this is being recorded, so you could always go back to this. Also on my site as well. Uh, there we go. Let's get back into, you know, I threw a lot at you guys, right? But those are kind of the fundamental ones that are kind of like, again, drinking from a fire hose as, I'm quoting uh, Sean earlier. But I want to save. I'd love to save as many as eight days a year, which is awesome. 
Working non-destructively, I think we've gone through this whole phase where we're like, yeah, we'd work destructively, now we're working sort of non-destructively where everything is sort of on its own layer or protected in some, in some case. You guys know a lot of these and I can click through them as well. Uh, in fact, I will. Guaranteed, I'm probably gonna show you some shortcuts here. Layer, layer masks, smart objects, clipping mask, adjustment layers, ugliness in that panel you can see right over there. You know, and that's what we would do. We would start to work that way. And let me just do this. First off, working with layers, I, can, I could say start to work on a design. I need multiple layers in here and I'll start dragging these different um, you know, images into one layer is what I'm doing, right? And I start to add these because anytime I'm creating a layout, I end up with all these layers, layer one, two, three, four, five. The big shortcut there, guys, is rather than trying to composite all into one PSD, I could just use bridge and I can select, I'll just select all these images and in bridge, I can say, hey, you know what? Photoshop, load, of all, load all of those files into various layers, right? So that's what I wanna do and this has been in here for a while and I, you know, again, find it hugely useful. I could kick back, have a drink of water real fast, listen to some music, what do we have playing? You know you do this probably. This is my free time, right? And what does it do to my layers panel? Is it just names each single layer the name of the file, which totally works out for me. So that's the fastest way for me to get up and running with, excuse me, when it comes to layers. Let me, you guys didn't see that. I should put that full screen. But there it is. This did not exist a second ago, but it just built those all in. Dot, 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 done. Right? Cool. So this is what you might do next. You might be like, okay, I need to, you know, you'll start moving elements around. Like, okay, I need to move this guy, this big triangle. I need to put on, oh no, I didn't move that. Oh, what layer is selected? Oh, I gotta go over here. Let me click on that. Now like, oh no, it was the wrong, like, taupey colored one, because it depends on the layer. So what you'll do is you'll change this. You change your move tool based on your selection, automatically select, right? And that's, and that's better, right? I can do that and I can move that around. So I feel like there's a new generation of people kind of working this way and might not be aware of layers. I pr my, my like pro tip here is just to turn that off and I can always hold down the command key. And so at will, sure I can navigate this way, selecting this guy, moving him over, but if I decide to hold down the command key, see how it toggles it, did you guys see that? It just toggles it on and off. So that's the fastest thing I can do when it comes to moving these items. Holding down the command key, putting this in place, playing with the, you know, different layer modes, get something cool, you know, maybe I'll just might move this, yeah, no, actually that's fine. Move that in. I have all my layers, they look good. What else we got in here? Let's check out this guy. We all understand layers. I don't need to belabor the point, right? We get it. Another huge one, we could talk for a day about selections and I'll, I'll talk to the f like five people on this front row and they'll have different ways of selecting things. And I'm not one to say that this is what right or this is wrong. Like whatever it takes to get the job done, right? Because like you might use your quick selection tool or your magic wand tool. Magic wand tool's been there forever, so I'll hold down the shift key and start getting him. I might use the quick selection tool, you know, and jump in there and do that. So there's another way. Some people might use the pen tool. Check this out. Like, okay, I'll use the pen tool. I'll start outlining this, and I will for certain objects, right? And I know, hopefully you guys can see that. Like, I don't know where the next drop is going to be. Like, okay, I'll put it right there. Or right there, oh no, the curve, oh, that curved a different way. There's no sort of projection or anticipation of where the next line is, when in actuality, if I roll this back a little, I can actually turn it on also, the rubber band capability. So project where that next line is gonna be. So now when I'm working, see how it's attached? It's like, okay, good, now I know to go there, to go there, because I have that projection. And what do you do? You'll, you'll put down a curve, you're like, bam, oh no, I suck, I screwed it up, and you have to go back. Hey, space bar, boop, picked it up, thank you. Put it back right over there, and I can start to work 
you know, on that, again, just holding down that space bar. As soon as I drop the point before I let the mouse up, I can adjust it. So again, those were just like pen tool extras. That wasn't even what I wanted to show you. I just think it's important when you're dealing with the pen tool. Okay, this case, and this always happens, you're trying to sort of remove the background. We realize this. You're gonna use a shallow depth of, you have a shallow depth of field going on here, really doesn't matter. But we added this, uh, it might have been in 2015, last year. But I just wanna select the focus area. Because I just wanna knock him out. And again, like this is hands-free mode because I'm not gonna touch it, and obviously it works, because it's a demo file. <laughs> I'm just saying varying levels of you know success with this but you could always tweak it it again did an auto uh, selection and nailed it but I could scrub this any way I want and I've, I've done this with other files and it works just fine and it'll get me maybe 80% of the where way and then I can refine it freaking a lot faster than uh, you know I'd usually than it would take me is all I'm saying let's refine that edge right because we're gonna have his hair his, his gorgeous hair, let's refine that. Let's make sure it's not all jagged, just using f refine edge. I'm just kind of making sure I get, you know, again, just those details sort of in his hair and in his, in his beard and stuff, right? And I can go on and on. And that's what refine edge does, is it does magic, in my opinion. Let's switch it to just like on black so we can see it. You should see it here in a second. But yeah, let's just go ahead and commit that. So it's gonna make a new layer with a layer mask. And technically there's two, let's not worry about that. But now I basically have him separated out. Like there he is. I can go on my way to start to make this composition nice and pretty, like put him in the desert. You know, like, he's like, I was, I was never there. I was never there. I this is Jess, Jesse Boykins, awesome, awesome guy. But uh, he would just say it really cool is all. Um, and then I'd move on. So that's sort of using layer masks. Done. Another thing people don't use a lot, and they should, and just something you need to know about, is just quickly masking items. Like I have this guy. Cool guy with the bike, right? I want him to be inside of, actually let me take a step back. I need to be inside of this uh, triangle, right? So you might shrink it down. Big habit I do is automatically just Anytime I resize something, I have the habit of just converting it to a smart object. Everybody knows smart objects, yes? Thank you. Cool. Just basically made it, for those who don't, who didn't raise your hand or a little shy, it's okay. Uh, basically, it made it a separate like PSD, so I've, it's sort of independent, it's, it's a separate file now. Only thing you need to worry about there is file size. How big is this gonna be if I have so many smart objects? But at this point, I can scale it up and down, it's not gonna be an issue. Bringing it in down here, dropping it in. In this case, rather than um, you know, sort of making a selection and putting a layer mask in there like that, sure, I could do that, but I don't have control over the BZA points. What I do is just make a clipping mask, right? So I'm just holding down the option key, and then when I do that, whoops, let me zoom out. When I do that, it'll just mask the bottom layer becomes the mask, and I could do that with as many items as I want to. So I could have five layers in this layer mask, and I can continue to work. And again, this is sort of your crash course in Photoshop. If this is stuff that you know, it should be really affirming for you, saying, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm making things this way, uh, even though your layers might look a little bit different. Like, here's one of my designs. Even though your layers might not be la uh, named, so you end up with this madness, by the way, because that's here, this one file of all this crazy, and I didn't name layers, and it's kind of messy, and that's what, that's, this is a case, I would say, for being able to sort through these layers. So check this out. I can see what's in here, right? There's been times where I needed to look for the smart object. Actually, that's a mask, but look for smart objects. The pro tip here, guys, is I could just show what's selected. Just show me what's selected in my layers panel, because this gets crazy. Now it's like, okay, I'm gonna come through, Oh, what is this? Oh, there's my skull. Oh, there's the mustache. There's sort of the, the mask piece, and then there's the hair. It's only what's selected is what I can deal with there. Another thing that annoys me, right? So this is a, this is a case you'll run into. Looking through this, um, like this isn't helpful. First of all, they're not named. 
I'm not sharing the, the, I feel like this is very bad to show. Nothing is named. But I have no visual representation of it either. Like at least show me the visual representation. So when I go into panel options, just show me the, not the entire document, because I have no idea what that is. Show me just the layer bounds. OK, and stop adding copy to everything, right? Just give me what I want. Oh, it's the curly cue in the hair. And then that should, helps me not name my layers easier and tell what it is, right? But again, that's, that's what I do is I'd end up with this design. I would still have, again, this design that I'm working on. Let's go beyond this, guys. You get, this is stuff you know. Let's take this, again, to the next, the next level, if you will, sort of your final poster, right? Your design. And typically, <laughs> Uh, you know, you'll do a design like this, and whether it's an, a user interface or whatever the case may be, you're like, do you like this one, or do you like this, this one? And they're like, no, what was the other one? Do you like this one, or do you like this one? Wait, hold on, do you like this one? <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> you, can, you can make layer comps, but what I end up doing for any alternate layouts, this is what I think it's great for, is, um, using artboards. So at this point, for this folder, I just find this easy, but I can just make an artboard from that group, right? There's my one artboard. Now I can start my second design, and if I hold down my option key or my awesome key, it'll just duplicate that design. Now I have two, and now I can say which one you like. You like, like the one on the left or the one on the right, right? Super easy. Super easy to do. Adding some more, you get the idea, and adjusting that content accordingly. And again, now we have four. This is just much easier to deal with. While I'm working on this, an artboard, I can just say, hey, through sorting, when I sort by artboards, I can say, just show me the layers for that one artboard. So that's another way to do things. Right, but now I have my, my different designs. I can export those out as individual files. That's gonna be in your export menu, pretty straightforward. Moving on from there, what I'd like to do is, you see the, the next iteration of this is using you know, artboards, say, for a website or any sort of interface. Because again, I can have you know, different versions of, say, this, you know, whether it's a website you see here, or getting into iPad sizes or iPhone sizes, right? And that's why we made artboards. Here's the artboard tool, in fact. If I draw out something, if I want to do it that way, I can do that. And I can make it sort of any one of these sizes, as you can see right over here. You know, iPhone 6 Plus, and then there's that particular size, and I can always rotate that. Cool? So artboards, probably a lot of people are like, yes, finally, because it was an illustrator before that. This brings up an issue, though, because as you, ha we've developed things sort of non-destructively. Ooh, I just forgot one thing, guys. Check this out. Probably the, I think it's probably the, you know, the most underlooked thing. So let's just jump to this photo. You'll have layer masks, right? You're like, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and add an adjustment layer and I'll do you know, brightness and contrast for that photo and adjust it, right? First of all, there's that use legacy that I mentioned a second ago, right? And you're like, okay, I need to like brighten it up so you'll add another layer mask, hue and saturation, or just like make it a shift the color a little bit, not to make it, her look sickly, but you get the idea. And this is the non-destructive way to work. And you guys are probably doing this today, which is fantastic. Start to stack all these up. You know what? There's actually an easier way to do this. So let me delete those. And let me just convert this to a smart object to protect it. Because now once it's protected by a smart object, I can add various filters. And camera raw is probably the most sort of unused item in Photoshop. Photographers know about it, but this will allow me to jump in with this photo 
And rather than selecting brightness and contrast and levels and all this other stuff and having all these layers just like you saw in my skull picture, that's actually what was going on. I, I admit it. Hit auto, it does all that stuff. It applies all those settings like I want. I feel like that's a good starting point place. Because look, I have exposure, I have contrast, the different highlights, so I can start to adjust this any way I want. Right? My saturation right down here. We have vibrance and saturation too. You're like, what are you, why are you messing with my head? You got vibrance? I don't even know what those two, it had to be explained to me basically, just so you know. <laughs> That's what I was saying to myself. What the heck? <laughs> Satra saturation will increase the saturation of everything. You'll, and what vibrance will do is take a lot of those midtones and beef those up. But if something's already blown out, it doesn't blow it out more. And it does a great job of protecting skin tones as well. So watch the saturation, like kind of like a pretty Oompa Loompa. <laughs> and then we have vibrance which just brings out that corn, but doesn't like make her look like she was involved in some sort of toxic oil spill or toxic spill. Let's go beyond that, right? So we can do everything in camera raw. Let's take it beyond that because again, when it comes to healing, first of all, uh, you know, again, pretty woman, there's not much we need to do here. I would use the, the, the rubber stamp tool, right? You'll jump in and do rubber stamp. Uh, rubber stamp, you can't, you can't go back and edit that. It just means more rubber stamping is how you, what you end up doing, when in actuality, with um, camera raw, I have spot removal. So I can say, hey, let's get rid of that spot, and then there it is. Not only does it automatically select the best area, but I could easily move that. And the great thing is, is once I click OK, I can go back into this file and then change it at any time. So it's like that flexibility of it not being destructive is super powerful, right? And again, I'll just, I can, oh, here's another thing. Painting, check this out, like if I wanted to, I'm not sure how this will turn out, but let's just do like this strand, maybe I don't want it there. I could actually like paint, rather than it just being one spot, I'll actually remove sort of all of that and I can adjust that. So we'll adjust that a little bit. And again, might not be perfect, but you kind of get the idea as I start to work on this maybe a little more. You guys get the idea. As I start to make two heads, but you get the idea. The thing is, is that it's protected right down here. I can always go back in and change it. So Camera Raw, probably the most sort of underutilized feature in, in Photoshop that's super powerful. And I got to speed through this, but you know, again, that's, that's a lot of it is uh, you know, working sort of non-destructively. And now we're in this phase of like working connected at the end of the day. I would just expect my assets to be with me everywhere. And this is most well represented through, through libraries, right? It's like your library's panel is your next most important panel next to uh, layers, okay? So if you are working in Illustrator and you're making a logo, let me show you this tool really fast as well. The Shaper tool, just because just you need to know about it and, and thinking about new ways to work and touch devices. The, you know, hopefully they come out with a, a Mac with a touch screen so I can actually draw these shapes. Well, I can draw shapes, I'm like, Oh, I kind of suck at drawing a uh, rectangle. Uh, no, you don't, Paul. Right? That's what it does. It's like, no, you're pretty good today. I'm like, what am I, what am I on? Is this really happening? You know, your circle, you guys get the idea. So again, same tool. I, freaking, I didn't have to change tools. The same tool, jumping in, adjusting, again, those different parameters depending on what it is, right? You can, again, get those different options and then the sort of pie chart, the, the number of charts that look like Pac-Man right there. So, okay. Let's go beyond that because I can start combining these, by the way. So, check this out. I got to just combine this. It's going to do a quick little icon. Working non destructively in here. Coming in here, let's, let's kind of adjust this. Maybe I'm making some sort of map, like pinpoint on a map. And again, I'm still using the same tool, by the way. I could just scribble that line out and it will, ooh, it will, <laughs> hold on. There we go. I had it selected, but I could just scribble that out. And the thing is, is that data, that information is still there. So I can jump in and say, hey, you know what? Let's move that this way or whatever. It's not like delete, uh, 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 permanently deleting that line, right? A better example here, let's just do this guy real fast. In terms of erasing, I'm just going to scribble out, what is it? What is it? Starting to look like a little fish. 
So again, just with basic shapes, quickly you have something like that. So pretty cool, gesturally, if you will, as well. So you end up, you know, again, with this, with this final version, something like that. Taking this asset, I was talking about working in a connected way with libraries. This is how I'd work. Rather than, you know, sure, my logo, my logo is great to have here. Let's take it, let's drop it into my library and it will be synced to, you know, it's going to be available to me everywhere, whether it's Photoshop, Illustrator, you know, After Effects, Dreamweaver, like everywhere, right? On mobile as well. But think of your whole style guide being in here as well. So I would create this, say it looks good. Let's jump back into, say, a design. I don't have to hunt down where that particular file is. It's going to be in my library. See, even though I'm in Photoshop now, I can drop that in, you know, and it's, you know, good, good to go at that point and work with that any way I want in this case. And it goes across files, so even if I wanted to put it in another sort of Illustrator file or across PSDs, I have that capability. So let's just drop this guy in, just doing this a couple times. We know what's going to happen here, right? Because these are all linked as I put this in for my little South by Southwest bingo game, right? I think one person out there has like all of these things. A chicken, is that rude? But anyway, a PBR, a pipe, a record player. Anyways, nonetheless, I'm putting this file right in here. And anytime I want to change it, if I change it, it's going to change across all of my various assets. Uh, you know, if I change this, actually, let's. Let's just change it to sort of your guide dash south by southwest. I'm just doing a simple change that we can all see, not doing anything subtle. As I save it, it's going to update. Again, here we can see it update. It's going to update in Illustrator and also back in Photoshop. As we can see, it gives me that dash. So that's the biggest thing that, again, we're working on is working connected in a connected way, which is huge, right? My whole library can be this way. But not only for me, guys, we can turn around and we can share this. Uh, right here, I can collaborate. You know, with Dave, for instance, I cl was collaborating with Sean earlier, and yes, that's, hopefully he doesn't mind I'm giving out his email address, but there it is. I think he actually might have given out on his last slide, but nonetheless, I can invite anyone to this folder. So him as the UI guy, he needs to deal with the logo and those various elements. He has access to it as well. He sees all of these assets. He's, I don't know if he's actually accepted that, but oh yeah, he has. Uh, yeah, he has. Because check this out, all of these various items are all being shared. So as soon as I update it, he's going to get a little flag. It's going to say, hey, update me. I'm like, and he could be like, sure, let's update, update it. And that's how that works. Does that make sense? I think that gets overlooked sometimes. And this is like really powerful being able to do that, right? Going beyond that, again, working in a connected way. Uh, let's just do this really fast. In that same browser, by the way, Creative Cloud, as I take a look in uh, my various files, so my assets, okay, the same place. I have files that are also available on my desktop that are in this Creative Cloud Files folder. So I have this design PSD right there. So if I decide I want to give this to Sean, he can have access to it. He can add comments to it. And we can take this to the next level, because all this is a, is a PSD. And already I'm viewing a PSD in a browser, which kind of blows my mind. right? I can see my current version and my various revisions right here. So I can click through those. I can click Extract. right? I don't know if you guys know this, but sort of going into the development phase, and whether Sean has this or not, he can access this particular graphic. He could say, hey, you know what? Let's download that graphic. right? Extract that asset. Right? This would probably be an SVG. OK? And that's what I do. Extract that out, click Save. It'll start putting it over here in Assets, as it should. 
Yeah, so that's where it appears. So without even needing Photoshop, I can start to extract content from this PSD. And that goes into my next point of starting to extract this content. Because yeah, I was able to do all this. You know, moving on from there, you know, producing these graphics or extracting assets is really easily done. Because again, taking that file, and I'll just open up this one. Same one that we're working on. I want to export out this same logo. In fact, let's give it uh, some style. Let's just add some layer styles because we need it to pop a little more. Uh, something like, like that. It's getting a little drowned, like washed out, but I can adjust it later. So it has layer effects on it. I can say, hey, you know, for that layer, go ahead and extract that out, make it a ping file. Okay, and what we're using right now is generate. So this is the easiest way to get assets out of Photoshop. And I can take this, there's a couple iterations of this. So there it is, there's my PNG file. It happens to be on my desktop. So let's just go to my desktop. Let's remove that folder from earlier. But there's my PSD. Here's my uh, file with my PNG file in it. All I need to do is say, hey, you know what, generate image assets. Okay, it creates this folder, and if I was fast enough, we'd see it generate that PNG file, right? So I didn't have to mash a bunch of keys together for save for web. Option, I don't even know, like it's all of them. That brings up that save for web dialog. It's like shift, control, option, command, S. It brings it up, that's all I know. It's probably only three out of those four. But I can go on that way, because that big image right there, that big uh, background image of Sherry right here, dot JPEG. Oh, let's, it's such a big image, let's make it 20% like quality, because I don't want it 100% as a JPEG. I'm tacking that on to the end, and I apologize, let me make it so you guys can see that. Sherry, 20%, Jesse, you know. Uh, JPEG or ping 24 or GIF or SVG, whatever the case may be. What if I want this to be half the size? I can do 50%. That's going to be half the size if it's at the front, right? This is a lot to take in, but this is all like pro, pro tips. Let's look in this folder. Oh, there they are. There she is. Awesome. Done, done, done. You get the idea. Oh, I decided, and, and then I just forget about it, by the way. I'm like, that's cool. You know, I'm just going to work away. I'm not going to worry about exporting things out. I decide I want to like remove this layer style because it's a little too washed out. As I do that and I go back in here, thank you very much, it automatically updates it. And even as I remove those files, it start removing those. Another pro tip as, as we're dealing with this, because it's been out, you know, a year, year and a half or so. Having a layer, if I decide I want lots, sort of like multiple things created, I can create a default layer at the top and say, hey, you know what? Make a high res folder and put everything in there and append the name or pre-append the name at two times, right? So that's what that does. Having an empty layer at the top generates those items. So I can have high res, I can have low res, by the way, right here. High res and low res and it'll start generating all those graphics as you can see them right there, okay? If you forgot all of that and it was like just a, a, a lot that I threw at you, it's fine, because I can always just right click on a bunch of layers and do export as, and that's the final thing I'll show in terms of exporting. One was generate, which is just naming layers, so yes, you do have to name your layers in that case. Export as, we'll kick out all these and I can define the size and do various things. There's a bunch of pro tips around that. Seems super easy and I can go on and on about that. Uh, again, we're talking about getting assets out of, out of Photoshop to use in a more conventional way. Uh, let's, let's take a look at something else, even this text for instance. What about CSS? And again, the same goes for Illustrator. If I wanted to copy the CSS for an item, it's right here. So I selected that Musicians You Love, copy that CSS. What does it do? It pastes it in my clipboard, and I can get it out of Photoshop that way. Done and done. But let's move on, because I only have a couple minutes, and I've been talking a lot about Photoshop, sort of producing graphics, again, with uh, you know, our export features. 
I mean, at the end of the day, we want to use the right tool for the job. Honestly, I think it's probably the tool I know is going to be the right tool for me right now. But eventually, I could think, OK, well, if I want to do something more, uh, maybe more UI or UX focused, what else is out there? And there's a ton of tools in your toolbox as a designer. So I'm going to kind of finish this up just to make you guys aware so my talk is balanced and uh, talk about uh, good old Project Comet. So who, was, who saw Talon's talk yesterday by a show of hands? OK, so that's like 25% of you, uh, which is awesome for, again, the other 75%. Otherwise, it's a, an iteration, which is cool. Brand new Project Comet is a project we're working on. I can easily create for these different screen sizes. But the powerful thing is, guys, is I can design and I can prototype in like one interface. And it's crazy fast currently. I mean, look at all these screens, by the way. Could you imagine if I opened that up in, in, in any other program? It would take like forever, and then my talk would be over, right? But nonetheless, I can come in here. And look at, in terms of performance, guys, I think I have over 200 screens. I can zoom in on these right here. And you know they're pretty straightforward. I'm going to have vector items. This, is, this obviously needs to be straightened, right? Let's fix that. No. <laughs> um, but doing those edits that I, I want to do, working with images, dragging those images in, as you'd expect, by the way. I'll show you my top features, which sure, uh, you know, dropping in an image. The big one is, is having sort of a repeated grid. So I want to duplicate this on down. I can click repeat grid. So rather than doing this in Photoshop, oh, thank you very much. It's already laid out, right? Look at the, the spacing the coloring of each one of these, what they say, customized. Oh, what about the images? Let's take a bunch of images. Let's drop them right in there. And notice how all the images have changed. OK, so this repeat, repeat grid happens to be like my favorite feature, because it makes it, especially when you're coming to all these screens, so much work. And it makes it super easy in doing this, right? My second feature, as I wrap it up, Prototyping. Now that I've created this, how do I sort of show how uh, people can interact with it and how it actually works? Well, I'm now in this prototype mode. Let's just click and drag and connect this to that screen. Let's slide left. That's good. Let's slide it back. It's already connected, right? Slide right. And then start to link these items. So if I decide I want to link this, I could link that to an entirely new screen. And you guys get the idea. I'm probably not even going to link it to the right screen, but you get the idea as I drag it down. Click play. I'll be able to interact with it. Explore. Easy, easy, easy. I could still go back in here and actually work on this, too. So if I decide that color of that text, say Machu Picchu, needs to be changed, I can change that easily. So again, Machu Picchu, see how that changes? Done and done. I want to share it with all the stakeholders. Let's go ahead and create a link right there. So this is Project Comet. I know Talon showed it the other day, and I think it's important just to keep an eye on. Next week, as far as like Twitch goes as well, twitch.tv forward slash Adobe, uh, we're going to have three days of like nothing but UI and UX experience, uh, 15th, 16th, and 17th, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of next week, right? So again, using, using new tools that you know, are, are coming is, uh, again, huge in that respect. So there's sort of your final slides. I don't care if you want to, I don't know, take a photo of that. A lot of these videos are on paultranny.com because it is, again, drinking like from a fire hose. But it's cool that this is also being um, live streamed and actually going to be available on demand. So what question, so thank you guys. Thank you very much.